All right, so welcome back. Uh, today we're going to move move on to the next, technically in the next module, uh, which is error handling, but it is so much closely related to functions uh, that you can consider this module and the last module basically to be one two week module if you really want to. But uh, so we'll be looking back at a lot of the functions that we've been developing so far and a lot of the topics that we've uh, looked at over the last week and we'll be getting a lot more practice as well. Uh, remember that we are on Piazza and we are on YouTube. So if you have any questions, please go ahead and post there. There we go. All right, so uh, error handling, right? Uh, every program is going to have the potential for errors, right? Uh, you could have user input errors. You could have errors that, uh, that are not expected at all. Some errors can be unexpected that, whoa, I didn't know that that would ever happen. Uh, somebody kicks out the cord from the computer, there's no way they recover from that. Uh, many errors can be anticipated and protected against. For example, if you're, if you're about to divide 1 divided by x, or you're about to take the reciprocal, what you can do is you can check to see, am I about to divide by 0? And if I'm about to div divide by 0, then I can choose not to do that. I can choose to do something else, because div division by 0 is undefined. And if you're, uh, if you're about to do something like that, then you can say, no, I'm not gonna do that dangerous operation. I'm going to handle things differently, right? We can anticipate and write code to, to do that for us, uh, to handle those errors, and that's called error handling. Or, or sometimes we can, let error, we can let errors be fatal errors. These are generally things that you can't recover from. Uh, somebody, uh, you're trying to connect to a, uh, um, uh, a remote database, pull some data and then crunch some numbers and produce a report. Uh, and, suddenly, and the computer that this program is running on doesn't have any internet connection. It's not your program's responsibility, nor within its ability to fix that error, uh, that, uh, that lack of an internet connection, right? Uh, so ultimately that error would, you know, you can always try again, see if they, uh, the connection's there again, Try it a third time. If not, okay, now it's fatal. We're going to quit out of this entire program, right? In C, our general strategy will be defensive programming. Right? There are some programming languages that have a better error handling built in uh, using exception handling and stuff like that. C does not have exception handling, and we, uh, we won't get into it too much here, uh, but of course, if you take a look at like a programming language like Java, more modern programming language, or even C++ or something, they have, uh, they have what's called exception handling. So the way that I like to present both of these ideas uh, is that defensive programming means that you're, you're walking along a path and you come to a, a cliff. Do you walk over the cliff? No. You look before you take that next step. You see, oh, okay, there's a hole here. I'm not going to walk out onto the cliff because if I do, I'll fall and get hurt or fall and die, right? It'll become a fatal error on my part. Uh, some other programming languages have exception handling, where literally they, do, uh, they have the keywords try. Go ahead and try this potentially dangerous operation. If you end up falling off the cliff, don't worry, we'll catch you. And they use the, the keyword catch, this exception, put you back up on the cliff and tell you something bad happened, you need to do, you need to do something about it, right? Uh, a programming language like C does not have exception, modern exception handling built into it. So we have to be more defensive. We have to look before we leap, right? Uh, we look, look before we leap, right? In other words, if we are about to, uh, do, uh, to perform a potentially dangerous or invalid operation, uh, we check to, uh, and if so, then we don't do it. We do something else, right? Now that something else could be, well, I don't know what to do in this situation, so we're just gonna quit out of the entire program or something like that. Uh, generally, you don't want to do that though, and we'll talk about best practices here in a second, right? Uh, instead, generally, you report the error, all right? So generally, let me, let me back up there. Generally, if an error occurs in a function, you 
Let me go ahead and get rid of this, and we'll start here. You don't quit out of the program. Right? Give me a potential error with the square root function. So you're calling the math square root function. What could you pass to it that is invalid? Yeah, go ahead. A negative number. A negative number. Why is the square root of, say, negative 1 not defined? Or is it defined? In math, it's defined. It's a complex number. We call that thing uh, what? I. Uh, we don't support, uh, or C does not support natively, that is. It doesn't support uh, complex numbers like that. So that would be a, an invalid operation. Uh, what about, uh, say, taking the logarithm of 0? Is that defined? No, what is that? In calculus, it would be, like, if you approach 0, uh, then it's going to be, ne uh, like, negative uh, infinity, right? Or divide by 0. Well, in calculus, as you approach, if you write out 1 over x, as you approach 0, then, of course, it blows up to positive infinity. Uh, those are defined in mathematics. They're not defined necessarily in coding. You've probably seen this already before if you've tried something like this. You get the, uh, the result inth, right? What does that stand for? Infinity. Sometimes you'll get the result nan, N-A-N. What does that stand for? Not a number. Not a number, right? So before we do something like that, we're not, uh, we, we can check to see if those operations are about to be invalid. But does the square root function, if you pass in a negative number, does it quit out of the entire program? Does it blow up? Does it delete the hard drive? No. You don't generally quit out of the program. Instead, instead, you report the error, the error, back to the calling function. Uh, it is the calling function's responsibility to determine how the error gets handled. Right? So if I called the square root function and it, uh, and it told me, hey, there's an error that was an invalid operation, you tried to take the square root of negative 1, it reports back to me and says, that's invalid. Then I can say, oh, okay, well... I'll handle that by asking the user again, can you please enter better inputs for me and try again? Or I can say, oh, okay, I'll use a, a different sensible default. Log of zero, I'll define that to be one for whatever reason. Some math, uh, or I'll define it to be zero as in Shannon's information theorem, theory or something like that. Uh, that uh, sometimes uh, mathematicians in certain branches of mathematics do redefine what it means for convenience for that particular domain. Or I, I don't know how to handle that. I'm just going to kill the entire program, right? And that's my decision. It's not the square root function's decision. It's not the math library's decision on how uh, uh, errors get handled. It's my decision. Uh, I, need to be, uh, I need to take responsibility for all that error handling, but I need to know that an error occurred. So the, calling, the function that I call has to communicate that back to me in some way, right? How does it do? How does it do that? Right. Generally, uh, yeah, I'll go ahead. Generally, errors are reported back to the calling function using error codes. Right. A zero. Uh, these are uh, error codes are generally zeros or uh, integers. Excuse me. Error codes or codes are integers. Right. Um, zero generally indicates no error. All right? Think of it like a question. Was there an error? Zero. False. No. No, there was not an error. All right? Otherwise, non-zero, non-zero error codes indicate some kind of error. The value, the, the actual value, can be used to determine what kind of error occurred. Each different kind can be handled differently, if you so choose. Uh, you, could, you could, of course, re uh, design your program so that in the event of any error, just go ahead and quit. I don't care. Right? Or if they gave me bad inputs, I could reprompt them for better inputs. 
Uh, if there is no internet connection, then I can go ahead and try to use a local file instead of uh, the remote file system or the, uh, the remote database, right? I could, uh, depending on the type of error, I could handle them all differently or I could just choose not to handle them at all and just keep going, let the program die of its own accord. Let it, let it go ahead and seg fault out. I don't care, right? Uh, that's, uh, that's up to them. But uh, the, the key is that it's my decision. Even if it's a bad decision, it's still my decision. It's not the math library's decision on how to handle that, right? And the only way that that's possible is by returning an error code, right? So what about actual outputs to functions? Right. If I'm going to return an error code, I can no longer say return, let's go over here to our example, get monthly payment. Given the annual rate, given the principal, and given the number of years for a loan, we returned a double indicating what the, uh, what the monthly rate on that was, right? or what the monthly payment, excuse me, on that was, right? Uh, well, if I change this so that I return an error code for any potential in bad inputs, how do I get my output back to the, uh, to the calling function? Can I return two outputs? Nope. Uh, just like uh, in mathematics, can you have two values of a function? No, that's not a function. It fails, but what kind of test does that fail? So is a circle a function? No, why? Because you have one x value that maps to one value up here and one value down here. It fails the vertical line test. You can't have a function mapping to two values. That's not a function. Likewise, in coding, that is not a function. A function can only return at most one value. You can have a void function that doesn't return anything, but you, uh, every function returns at most one value. You can't do something like this. Okay, so am I stuck? I, you can't do this. Remember what we just covered on Monday, passing by reference. And I gave you the analogy of a bucket, right? With the swap, I'm going to give you not a variable. I'm not going to give you 10 or 20 or something like that. I'm going to give you a bucket. And you can take something out of that bucket. You can put something into that bucket. And I still have that bucket. Well, what if I ask you for the monthly payment and I tell you to put that in that bucket? Right? You can put that value into the bucket and you can also communicate back to me an error code. Essentially, you can use pass by reference to return, return, and I'll put that in the double quotes here because you're not actually returning anything, but you can return multiple values because we have pass by reference. So what is that? Uh, so uh, again, how do we do that? Uh, what about the actual outputs of the function? Uh, you can you can use a pass by reference variable variable to return any uh, actual result, and then use the return value to indicate an error. And if there was an error, what type of error was that? Okay. So again, common mistakes do not exit out of the program, right? Do not echo or print an error message within the function. If you want to uh, uh, communicate to the user that there was an error with their input or something else like that, uh, you do, uh, you, you, then it's the calling function's responsibility to handle that. Uh, does the square root function tell you a printout to the standard output? Hey, sorry, you called me on a, a, a negative value here. I can't handle that. Do you ever see any output like that? No, because if every single function started printing its own messages everywhere, guess what? You will have millions and millions of lines of output on a, the, even a simple program. Uh, so we don't wanna do that. We don't wanna take that kind of strategy. Also, you do not generally make errors inside of a function fatal. In the main, that is perfectly fine as, you, as we've been doing. But now that we're writing functions, you should understand that you don't just call exit within your own function because that, that, that takes the decision-making process away from whoever called it. Imagine, imagine a, an implementation of the square root function that did just that, that exited, right? Now you, it, it makes all your decisions for you, right? And me, it means now that you are responsible for checking for errors for that defensive programming, okay? So let's go ahead and take a look at a demonstration here. 
let's go ahead and modify our loan program, our loan functions, to do some basic error handling. Okay? And for that, I'm going to go ahead and remind you what the, uh, uh, what the formula is for a, sorry, get rid of that. There we go. For the uh, monthly payment. Rate times the principal. So rate would be like, say, 5% a year. Uh, multiplied by the principal, say $10,000. And then over one, uh, one minus one plus the rate again, raised to the negative N. N is the number of years there, okay? So now if you look at this formula really closely, what are some possibly bad inputs? What about N? Yeah, go ahead. All right, the rate could be smaller than zero. Has anybody ever heard of a bank giving out a loan there where they pay you interest? Well, no, that's a savings account, but that's not a loan, right? Uh, wow, if, if you ever have a bank that does that, borrow a billion dollars, right? And, uh, and uh, as much as you can, don't spend any of it uh, and earn interest by them paying you for that loan. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, what about uh, the other end of that? Generally, the rate can't be more than 100%. Now, legally, the rate can't be more than, say, I don't know, 20%. It's called usury, and there are regulations against this, right? So, but we, we won't go that far. I don't know what the regulations are, frankly, so we, we can't do that. We'll just say that we can't be more than 100%. What about the principal? Can you, uh, is, uh, can you walk into a bank and say, I want to take out a loan for $0? Now, what are they going to say? Okay, thank you for coming in today. Uh, here's your zero dollars. Goodbye, right? Can you ask for a loan for negative five hundred dollars? That that again is a uh, that's a savings account. It sounds like that to me, that where you're putting money into the bank. So probably, the principal has to be positive. What about the years? Okay, zero. What happens if we put in zero for n there? What happens to that? It becomes one. One minus one is zero. And if we try to divide by that, it blows up. Uh, also, uh, I mean, you can't, ha uh, you can't have negative years either. That doesn't make any sense. Um, I mean, I, I guess I want to take out a loan uh, over the negative five years, meaning that I'm going to go back in time and pay it five years ago. That doesn't make any sense. So let's go ahead and take care of all those, uh, all those er potential errors here. And I'm going to do that in the get monthly payment function, right? Because you give me the annual rate, the principal, and the years, and each one of those has a potential error, right? Uh, I'm not going to worry about, you know, up, down, whatever. Let's just go ahead and start taking care of each, uh, of each one separately. So if the annual rate is like you said already less than I, I guess you could have a free loan right zero zero percent interest loan they offer those on new cars all the time right so if it's less than zero or the annual rate is greater than one right? then we'll go ahead and suppose that that's an error right what uh what else what about the principal? If the principal is less than or equal to zero now, of course, because it doesn't make any sense to have a, a zero balance a principal loan, uh, then this is another error. Uh, what else? If years is less than or equal to zero, then it's another error. Otherwise, we can go ahead and take care of this, and this is just fine. Now, look before you leap. Does it make any sense if I put this down below? I'll go ahead and do my error checking down here instead. <laughs> You've already returned the value. You've already done the dangerous operations. If year is zero, then this is going to end up as a division by zero here and not a number. Nan. Right? You look before you leap. Right? You always do error checking before you do this potentially dangerous uh, operation. Okay. Now, what do, what do we do in the event of an error? 
So do we start printing out messages? Uh, you gotta no. give me a, a, a valid rate. Right. End, line, end the line. Right. No, again, 99% of all software out there is not meant for human consumption. It's meant to automate a process. That's why we write software, right? Some, nobody's gonna be sitting there looking at, uh, generally, nobody's gonna be sitting there looking at this and say, oh, there's somebody uh, uh, to the debugger. Uh, we've got some bad input here somehow, right? This is not meant for humans. This is meant to tell the calling function that you gave it bad inputs. If you wanna print an error message to the user because they gave you bad inputs at the command line, then so be it but it is not my responsibility to do that because this function could be used in some automated process where there's not even a human involved at all. Right? So we're not gonna print anything. You don't wanna do that. Right? Do we exit out of the program? Nope, because that would be a fatal error. Right? And that would be taking the decision-making process away from whoever's calling this function, okay? So what do we do instead? will return without doing this potentially dangerous operation computation down here, right? Dangerous, invalid, what, however you want to consider it, right? So let's return. Can I just do that? Is this a void function? Nope. Uh, so lots of people were asking about, uh, uh, the, the, I think we came up three or four times on Piazza yesterday, about this mysterious mention that uh, the, uh, the error code uh, from their compiler that said reaches a non-void function without returning anything. You're not returning anything, right? And this is not a void function. So we need to return something. What should we return? Zero. Zero is in the event of no error, right? Just ask yourself the question, was there an error? Zero, false, no. Is everything fine here? No. Nope. So let's return something else. Yeah. One. One? Okay. Why? Because it was the next number that popped in your head? Okay. All right. What about this error down here? What if we were to do the same thing? Return one. It didn't reach the same error. That's the same type of error that's being t uh, communicated back to the calling function. How do I know that the annual rate was the bad input versus the principle was the bad input that I gave. If I'm returning the same value, I cannot distinguish those two things. Yeah. So then the rate of numbers. All right, so what's next? Yeah. Two, okay, all right. And following that same pattern, what should I return here? Return zero, oh, oh, sorry, yes, three. <laughs> I can't count today. Right. Now, this value right here is the actual result. I'm going to put that into another variable here, temporarily, okay? Error handling down here. If we've gotten to this point, did an error occur? No. Nope. So what should we return here? Zero. False. No error, right? No error occurred. Great. What about that result? It's stuck there, right? I'm not returning it because I'm now returning an integer error code. Uh, I take three inputs here. Uh, I compute the result, so I've got your $188.71 or whatever it was in the example that we were doing, right? But there's no way to get it back to the calling function. So what I need is a bucket, right? So double result. Right? Can I do it like that? That is a pass by, uh, so the, all four of these variables are now passed by reference or passed by value. Right? Value, basically it's an input. You're giving me the result. Why the hell did you call me then, right? Uh, if you've got the result. You need to give me a bucket so that I can put this result in there. Right? And by the way, is result a good variable name? Nope. So what should I call it? I should call it what it is, and what is it? monthly payment. There we go. And how do I turn this into a bucket? How do I turn this into a pointer, a reference that I can then jump to and put that $188.71 figure into there? Uh, careful, it's going to be star. star. Ampersand is the referencing operator. It takes a regular old variable and makes it into a pointer variable. 
when uh, you know when you need the uh, memory address. Uh, star th that's going to be when you declare a pointer variable, or it's the dereferencing operator. It's when you take the uh, a pointer variable and you change it into a regular old variable so that you can put a value in it. And that's what I'm going to need to do down here. I don't need the result at all. I want to put this value, this, uh, this, uh, this expression over here, I want to put that into monthly payment. Is that the correct way of doing it? Nope. This is a pointer variable now. I need a regular old variable. So what do I do? I dereference it. Right. Don't worry, you'll eventually get it, especially as you start working with it tomorrow. Or not tomorrow, but next week. Uh, you don't have to do error handling, I believe, on this hack. I mean, you have to do rudimentary error handling, like on uh, command line arguments or whatever. Uh, but the, that's what uh, the next module is all about, because now we're talking about error handling. Think back to your uh, lab yesterday. Where would this come in handy? Remember that you had that to sepia, I think it was, right? And you had to have three functions, one to do the red, one to do the blue, and one to do the green, right? Why did you need three functions? Because you had to return three values, right? There's no way to return three values. There's only one, oh, you can only return at most one value. But now that you've got pass by reference variables, what can you do? You can have three pointers, three buckets, in which you can put the red, green, and blue values into there. And you only have to have one function now, right? Much simpler, instead of, two sepia red, two sepia blue, two sepia green. Now you have two sepia and you take red, blue, and green buckets to put stuff in. In this case, we only have one result. And, uh, but I will show you maybe by the end of the day or certainly by next week, uh, another exercise where we're doing that. Yeah. Uh, you would add, well, once you're, once you're returning all the results using pass by reference variables, that frees up the return value. And then you can change that into an integer like we did here, and that's where you return an error code. Uh, the red was out of range, the green was out of range, the blue was out of range, or something like that. Right. This looks pretty good. Of course, I'm going to need to change my uh, prototype. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, we're going to have to change that now. Yes, we're going to have to change our loan program now to accommodate this. But before we change the loan program, we need to change the prototype. And we need to change the documentation because we've changed the behavior of the function. So int and the last one was a double star monthly, monthly payment. There we go. It was a double star, right? Okay, good. There we go. This function computes the monthly payment of a loan based on whatever formula. Uh, placing the result into the last pass by reference variable. Right. If an error, if bad inputs are given, and to do describe <coughs> the possible bad inputs. That's what documentation is all about. It's now for humans, right? It returns uh, this error code or that error code or that error code. It ref uh, describe those possible bad inputs so that they know that you, you shouldn't be doing that, right? Uh, if, they just block, if we just don't have any documentation, and oh, I didn't know that I couldn't give you a negative value for green, right? Uh, you need to communicate that to the user, the person that's actually using your library of functions right? and yourself, of course. If bad inputs are given, a non-zero error code code is returned. Right. And by implication, a zero error code is returned in the event of no errors. Okay. Let's make sure that this actually compiles before we move on to the main uh, program here. Remember how we compile utility files. Right. We've got utils.c and utils.o, or sorry, utils.h. I want to produce a utils.o file. How do I do that? Hyphen c utils.c. And probably lm, I, I think I am using math, right? Yep. 
there we go, that produces the utils.o file, right? which is just a binary file. And now how do I uh, compile everything together? Uh, loan and utils.o. And of course, it's gonna say, well, wait a second, monthly payment, you changed all that, right? There are too few arguments. Uh, I only know about these three arguments in loan, get monthly payment. I, you're only passing in three arguments here. You should be passing in four, okay? So how do we change this now? I need the fourth argument and I also need to change the return value here because now I'm returning an error code. So how do I change that last value there? Okay, monthly payment. All right, and well, I, I don't have that variable yet, do I? I need to create that variable, do I, don't I? So double monthly payment. This is a common error that I see, right? And then I'll just pass in monthly payment. It's already a pointer variable, right? And get monthly payment requires a month, uh, pointer variable, right? So this matches, are we good to go? What is monthly payment pointing to after line 26? Nothing. Null, uh, I don't know if I've mentioned it before, but uh, dead beef, right? Dead beef, right? Zero X dead beef, right? That is hexadecimal code. Hexadecimal is uh, base 16. We're base 10 because we're humans with 10 fingers and 10 toes. Computers are base two because they are binary, zeros and ones, on and off. High charge, low charge, right? Uh, but you can also have different base systems. One way of expressing data is to uh, use base 16, which is hexadecimal. Hexadecimal, base 16, you need 16 symbols. So you use zero through nine. Well, you need six more. So what do you use? A, B, C, D, E, F. And then what can you do with that kind of stuff? You can start making words, right? Dead beef. Uh, what, what words can you make with just A, B, C, D, E, F? Right? Dead beef was one. Uh, one that I commonly use is B A five E B A one one baseball, right? This is just hex speak, right? Kind of like leet speak or whatever, you know, uh, it's, it's just a way of creating words with a limited number of letters or, or, or numbers that look like letters. Dead beef is commonly used to indicate uh, it's a special symbol that's com commonly used to indicate uninitialized memory, right? So whatever was there before is simply just dead beef. Warning, warning, this is dead beef, don't eat it, right? Or uh, I, I guess if it's rotten beef, you shouldn't eat it. Of course, if it's dead beef, uh, chow down, right? As long as it's cooked well, or, and I am not a vegan. Right? All right, so what is it pointing to? Who knows, all right? Don't do that. That is a valid variable. Now you can put an ampersand in front of it to get the memory location of that valid variable that you can now use. Right? So don't do what I just did, uh, where I create a variable, I don't make it point to anything, but I pass it to another function. We also need to capture that return value, int, error, type, say, whatever, and get monthly payment. This should work. And in fact, it should give us the same, uh, yeah, I just need to, oh, find hyphen LM, there you go. Let's go ahead and run it again. What, what have we been using before? I think we've been using $10,000, uh, 5% interest and five years, right? And uh, is it okay? Yep, remember we, we, we didn't go all the way to the last month because we set, put in a to-do, right? Handle that, I still haven't done the to-do, right? <laughs> That's the, that's the whole point of doing the to-do, so you don't have to do it. <laughs> Make sure that you don't have to-dos left over in your code when you submit it, of course. Okay. All right, so at least it's ru still running correctly. The monthly payment is $188.71. Okay. Uh, by the way, now that we have that round to cents function, maybe we should be doing that in this function to begin with, right? Round to cents. Call that other function up there so that you don't have to do it over here in the main. Function calling function, right? Uh, now, it's, uh, now you're expected that once you, uh, once you call that function, you will get something that has been rounded to cents. Okay. All right, now we can do error handling. 
if the error type is equal to one, then I'll go ahead and print up uh, some error. I forget which one I forget. Which one? No, don't remind me yet. <laughs> I'm doing this on purpose. I do remember which one. And exit. Now it's our decision to exit. Uh, else if error type, error type is the other type, and I don't remember what that one was either, then I'll go ahead and exit and some other error, some other error, I forget which one. Right. And then finally, if it's another type of error, three, some other, yet, and yet another, yet another type of error, I have no idea what it was, and then we'll exit on them. In fact, we can make our exit codes match our error codes. And now you understand why exit takes an integer. Zero is for everything was great. The program exited normally. Return zero achieves that. Exit one is one type of error code. Exit two is a different type of error code. So that way you can run an entire program from another program and get the error code and then do inner program error handling. We won't go that far. Uh, but I do want to draw your attention to, I forgot. One, what is that? Two, what is that? Three, what is that? You've got a good memory. I don't have a good memory. Come back in three months and tell me what those error codes stood for. Are you going to have a good memory then? Probably not. One, two, three. Those are called magic numbers. Magic numbers are numbers that came out of magic. What were those again? So if you use magic numbers, you always have to go back to your function. Oh, okay. An error code of one meant that the annual rate was bad. Uh, okay. Three months later, you forget everything yet again. Error code type two. What the hell was that again? I have to go all the way back over here to my code and find out. Oh, that was the principle was, uh, was not positive, right? There's got to be a better way than using these, these mysterious magic numbers. Mag other magic numbers that are okay, say 3.14159. Everybody knows that to be pi. 2.74, uh, 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 sorry, 2.71, blah, blah, blah. I don't even remember the rest of it. That's going to be E, right? Now we're getting a little bit esoteric, right? 0. 0.12345678901011112. Does anybody know what that is? That's a Champer noun constant. How can you not know what that is? Nobody knows what that is. It is a real thing though, right? Uh, it's, just all, it's just all the numbers concatenated together. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, then 1, 0, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, right? Uh, it's got some, uh, it's a normal number by construction. It's this nice little you know, idea in mathematics. Don't worry about it, right? But nobody knows what that is, right? So we don't want magic numbers. Instead, we want human readable error codes. Wouldn't it be nicer if I had, say, some English that I could read? Uh, an invalid annual rate. Something like that. Everybody can read that, right? And now over here in my uh, uh, main program, instead of comparing it to one, I can compare it to invalid annual rate. And oh, okay, now I can write my error message without having to look back at everything. Uh, you, uh, the, the annual rate must be between zero and one. Right. Let's keep going. What should I call error code two instead? Invalid, okay, principle. Invalid principle. Right. And? All right, some other error. Now, now I know what it is because I can read it in plain English. Principle must be not, uh, must be positive. Right. And finally, the last one, what's a good name for that one? Invalid years, right? Remember, there are only two difficult things in computer science, cache invalidation and naming things, but this should be easy enough, right? Name it what, what's on the tin, right? You know, you've got a, a, a tin of food, right? Uh, you know, like a, a tin can of food. What's in it? Well, the label says dead beef. Right, well, what's probably in it? Probably dead beef, right? 
All right, so yet another error. I forget which one. Uh, we can say uh, years must be positive. Now we don't have any mysterious magic numbers that come from who knows where, right? Now we have some valid English. Is this gonna compile though? No. C doesn't know anything about, what the hell is invalid years, right? C doesn't know anything about invalid principle or invalid annual rate, right? So how do we achieve, or how do we tell C what these are? You could define them. What's one way of defining them? All right, one way is hashtag define invalid rate, uh, annual rate to be one, right? Define the other ones, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to show you a new way using enumerated types, okay? Uh, let me see here. I just wanna look at my notes. Yeah, here we go. Uh, by the way, it is perfectly valid to use preprocessor directives like that. The C standard libraries use preprocessor directives. We might look at that next week, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, but it, it is common to do that. I'm showing you another way here. Right? And it's a little bit more preferred over uh, preprocessor uh, values. And I'll show you what, how, why and how. So type, what I'm going to do is I'm going to define my own type. Type def is short for type definition. Enum is short for an enumerated type. Now, what's an enumeration? It's like a what? A list. That's exactly what it is. It's a list of things. It's an enumeration. The first thing, the second thing, the third thing, the fourth thing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's what an, enumer an enumeration will, our enumeration will be. What did we define? We defined invalid annual rate. We defined invalid principle. And it will be commas. Right? By the way, I'm putting these one to a line. That's a style thing. Uh, you, uh, the, the white space doesn't matter. You could have a list like this, like English. That's a little bit less readable, though. If one thing is, uh, if there's one thing to a line, that's kind of more like a bullet pointed list, a bullet pointed enumeration. And that's much easier to read. The Oxford comma, <laughs> uh, the, the, the coding Oxford comma. Uh, anybody know what the Oxford comma is? So I like, yeah, I like cake, it's comma, ice cream, it's comma, comma, and uh, burritos, right? That, uh, so do we use the Oxford comma or not? I, I forget what the APA style is now, uh, or the MLA style. Uh, don't use it? Okay. Well, this is basically the Oxford comma encoding. And you do use it because it's best practice. If you come down here and you find out that you need yet another um, uh, error code, blah, whatever, then it's already there and you don't have to put, uh, to put it in. Right? So it is common, in fact, best practice, uh, arguably, uh, that you do put in that last comma, even though there's not, nothing else left. Now, this enumerated type needs a name. An integer name, uh, an integer's name is int. A floating point number's name is double. A character's name is char. We need to give this thing a name. That's bad. Oh, there we go. So what should I call this? What is it? An error code. Okay. I like that. All right. There we go. Note there that I'm using upper camel casing. When we used functions, we used, when we define functions, we use lower camel casing. The first letter of each word was uppercase, except for the first one, which was lowercase. That's why it's called lower camel casing. And do we see why it's called camel casing, by the way? Everything is humped, right? There, there, this, there, there are two humps on this uh, camel right here, right? Because there are capital letters instead. This is upper camel casing. I do capitalize the first word. Also note, how am I, how am I, uh, what's, what convention have I used here for my error codes? all caps and an underscore separating them, right? That distinguishes them from regular old variables. So I have defined my own enumerated type. I've called them error codes. Internally, they're still integers, but we can now use an error code in our code uh, now instead. Over here, instead of returning an integer, I can say, no, it returns an error code. Right? 
and that's what these things are returning. Over here in the uh, uh, prototype error code, we can return an error code instead. And over in our main, instead of an integer, we can say that error code error type. And we can still make an equals equals comparison. Is it an invalid error uh, invalid uh, annual rate, an invalid principal, an invalid years, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that we're almost there on whether or not it will compile. And it does. Now, I should have compiled, recompiled everything else. Uh, there we go. And then compiled that. And it still runs as normal. Right. There we go. What if I gave a bad rate of, or, you know, bad principle of ten, negative $10? Principle must be positive. Right. Much more elegant now. Okay. Except for... I forgot something. Let me scroll down. What are we still returning in the event of no error? Zero. Okay. Hmm. No error? Okay, I like that. Error. Error or... There we go. Error. Where should I put that here? Remember, it's an enumerated type. It's a list. Where does a list start? At zero, right? Now, English lists start at one, two, three, four, right? But we always start at zero. That's actually how enumerated types work. Uh, enumerated types aren't anything special. They're just syntactic sugar, right? They're ad an added way of doing something that is complex in an easy way. Um, before, what happened was this thing got the value zero, this thing got the value one, this thing got the value two, it just goes in order. Right? So that's why it, you, if you want an error code, a, a zero error code that indicates no error, that comes first. Right? Now this is zero, this is one, this is two, this is three. You can short circuit that behavior, by the way, that default, by starting it somewhere yourself. Now it'll be 10, 11, 12, 13. Kind of weird, but so be it. Why do that though? I, I, I even hesitate to show you that you can do that because then you'll want to do that and you'll start breaking things. Yeah. If you do that, if, can you do like 10, then 11, then 9? You can, go, you can uh, assign a value for each one of these. You can do whatever you want, but it's going to be an integer. You can't do... 0.5, probably integer truncation there. I, I don't know. Hopefully that's a warning too. Uh, let's find out. Yeah, uh, it's not an integer constant. So, oh cool, it's an actual full on error. There we go. There, but you can do negatives. Right? Don't do that though. Undo, 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 undo. Right? It's just weird. You're doing weird stuff for the sake of being weird, <laughs> I guess. Okay. Any questions so far? All right. So then to review, uh, let's go ahead and review enumerated types first. See in see enumerated types. So again, many pieces of data are going to have a fixed number of possible values. For example, days of the week, months of the year, Etc. Error codes. In C, you can define enumerated type to hold human readable terms uh, for your list of possible values. Right? And here's another example that I'll put in the notes. Right? So, the days of the week. Uh, here, here's a good debate. What's the first day of the week? Monday. Monday? <laughs> Sunday? Monday? Tuesday? Anybody say Wednesday? Certainly not, right? Well, we'll go ahead and go with Sunday because that's what my calendar looks like. Right? Uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thurs uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Right? And I'm calling that day of week. Right? Let's make some observations here. Uh, first of all, the uh, the, each one of them is uses up, uh, upper underscore casing. Now, each one of these was only a single word, but if you have multiple words, you would separate them with an underscore. Uh, because if you, don't ha if you don't separate the separate words, they all chunk together, and it becomes really, really unre uh, unreadable. Right? You use upper, upper camel casing for the names of the enumerated type. Right? 
Now, there are alternate conventions. This is the one that I'm suggesting. Right? If you want to use something else, like uh, the, an alternative would be uh, lower underscore casing, where it's all lowercase letters, words are separated by an underscore, right? then go ahead and do that. I tend not to do that because if you're writing the underscore a, long, a, a lot, what are you doing again? You're taking your left pinky and you're putting it on the shift key and then reaching all the way across the keyboard uh, to hit that underscore and eventually your left pinky will fall off. So save your pinky and use more modern conventions that I'm suggesting. Okay. Uh, we have to use the uh, uh, upper camel case, uh, upper underscore casing just because we've run out of possibilities, right? Uh, you put one on each line. Then later in your program, you can do something like this. The day of the week today is, actually today is Wednesday, right? All right. Next le lecture would be Monday. There we go. All right. You use type def, def enum to define it, right? Uh, you provide a comma delimited, delimited list of items inside curly brackets. That's just the basic syntax. Uh, a semicolon is necessary at the end of the name of the enumerated type. Did everybody notice that? Semicolon right there, right? So remember that semicolon right there. The last comma is, of course, optional, but generally that's, uh, that, that's what you do, right? You generally, generally, home row, uh, declare, oops, sorry, declare uh, enumerated types in a blank file, dot, dot, dot. Where did I put it? Did I put it in the header file or did I put it in the source file? I put it in the header file. Why did I put it in the header file? Over here in the loan, uh, in the loan file, I included the, the H file. If you want to use it, it needs to be in that header file. If it's stuck over here in just inside the uh, source file, then it's not, then loan is not going to know anything about it. It has to bring it in from the header file. And by the way, I think I, I, I demonstrated why you don't do this, but uh, there are still some people that were getting this wrong and uh, including a source file. Do we ever include source files? Never. Because if we do, what's going to happen? Oops. I, I thought, oh, sorry, loan. There we go. Now, right, multiple definitions here, first of all, but also, uh, uh, no, here, let me, let me do it like this without the O file. There we go. Now this should happen. Oh, come on, really? All right, fine. Um, oh, no, what I meant here, okay, let's undo this. Here's what we saw yesterday. I'm in the utils.c file, and it includes itself. Now what's going to happen? What is it doing? It's, calling itself infinitely. it's including itself infinitely. Because all the preprocessor does is takes the content of the file, cuts it, paste, copies it, pastes it. Well, you still have that include utils.c file. So copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. We're stuck in an infinite loop here. I'm going to kill it. Right? Don't do that. You only ever include C files, uh, or uh, header files, excuse me. Uh, have we ever included stdio.h or .c or stdlib.h? All right, one of these things is not like the others, right? And you don't like things that are different in in computing, right? In in your code, at least, you like uniformity. Right? Okay, so uh, I need to get this back to a workable state here. Uh, utils. <laughs> I don't know if I've I've screwed everything up. Oop, not that. <laughs> LOM, I don't know what LOM is. Uh, GCC, utils.o and loan.c with the math library, and we're all good to go again. Right? There we go. I need to provide the command line arg arguments, though. Okay. All right, so you generally declare, declare them in a header file. All right? 
There we go. Um, so how does this actually work? And this is the last thing that we'll probably talk about today, but uh, internally, internally, C assigns an int value to each element, each element starting with zero, right? That's the default. Uh, so Sunday, Sunday, in our example that we just did, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, because we started at Sunday, has a value of zero, right? Uh, what would Monday have? Has a value of one, right? Dot, 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 one. Uh, what's the last day of the week then? Saturday has a value of six. There are seven days in the week, right? We all know that, right? And since we started at zero, we, won't, we go up to six. Consequently, you can, but really shouldn't, do the following. Right? I'll go into code mode here. And I will say day of week when I can do addition Monday plus Tuesday. Does that make any sense? No, but it does make sense in code. Why? Monday is one. Tuesday is two. So one plus two is three. What is three? Wednesday. Monday plus Tuesday is Wednesday. Okay. Uh, I can also say when is equal to today plus 50. Is that going to be 50 days from now? No. Nope. It's going to be, what? It, well, let's say Monday. Monday, which is 1 plus 50 is 51. Is there a 51th day of the week? No, it doesn't wrap around, right? It just goes to an invalid value that you did not enumerate. C will not stop you from doing this. The compiler will not detect this. The compiler should probably won't even give you a warning about this. Uh, and it, 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 your, your code will just break, right? Uh, bad things will happen, right? Because your assumption that these are always valid enumerated types uh, is not, uh, it is not gonna hold, right? So understand that they are integers, but do not treat them as integers. But you can always use them in expressions. So for example, Back to football. If today is Saturday, then we can watch football. Right? As long as you have Fox Sports 1, I think. Right? I don't. So it's to the bar. Right? Uh, again, nobody, nobody watches football, apparently. All right, fine. Any questions on enumerated types, error handling so far? Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to set you up for next time. Let's do a, a few more exercises exercises All right our first one is going to be uh, design a fu and ri and rigorously test a function uh, to compute the amount of change right so given uh, a uh, uh, a, um, a dollar amount dollar amount in the range of zero through 99 cents, All right? There we go. So zero dollars, uh, zero dollars through 99 cents. Of course, if it's more, if it's five dollars, then we're already talking about dollars. And outputs, and I'm putting that in quotes there because it's not actually going to output things because it's going to return multiple values. It's going to output the number of quarters, nickel or dimes, nickels, and pennies. To make change, right? and you can very easily see how you uh, use case for this, right? If you had to write this function for an automated teller machine, uh, you know you've seen them at, uh, at uh, convenience stores and such that you give them the money, uh, the, and uh, they don't have to make change. Instead, the change flows out in that little thing, and you're and you can grab it if you want to, or you can leave it for the next person or whatever, right? So if I gave you seventy-five cents, what would you tell me? Optimal change, by the way. Don't give me 75 pennies. Three quarters. Zero dimes, zero nickels, and zero pennies. Don't forget the rest of your output. What if I said 
85, 86 cents. Three quarters, one dime, uh, zero nickels, good, and one penny. Right? So we're going to design a function to do that. Now, quarters, nickels, dimes, uh, quarters, dimes, nickels, pennies. That sounds like four outputs to me. Am I going to be able to? Am I going to have to write four different functions to do this? Nope. I'm going to have four pass by reference variables to do this. One input variable to tell me how much change you actually need, like what, what's, what's the actual change amount. Uh, and then also I'm gonna do some error handling because if it's more than 99 cents, are you gonna go, oh, I guess if it's $2, you could give me eight quarters, uh, but we're not gonna design the function to do that. Uh, if it's more than 99 cents, we're gonna reject that, okay? If it's less than zero, we're gonna reject that as bad input. So we're gonna do error handling we're gonna do multiple uh, return values through uh, pass by reference variables, et cetera. And then we're gonna rigorously test it. What does rigorously testing mean? Does it mean putting it in a function, uh, putting it in a main and then typing out the input? Okay, that looks good. Typing out another input? Okay, that looks good. Typing out another input? Oh, there's a bug there. I need to go fix that. All right, start back up at the top. That's the first one that I tried, second one that I tried, those still are good. The third one I tried, okay, now it works. Is that rigorous testing? No. Nope. What? You run a for loop through zero to 9, 0.99. Oh, okay, you, wow. you, you're going all the way to automated testing. Uh, but uh, the, where uh, he, he said that you could write a for loop to try every single possibility uh, from not zero to 99, but well, also like say negative 10 up to 200 because you want to test all those error conditions too, right? right? You, want to, you want good code coverage, but also you want to automate this in some way, right? Like you were doing in your lab yesterday where you write a test. Here's the input. Here's the expected output. Call the function, get the actual output. Does the actual output match the, actual, or the uh, expected output? If so, pass. Increment a counter, that, that test passed. If not, then failed, right? One test passed, one test failed. Report that as a summary. That you, 99% uh, of your tests uh, are correct. Is that enough? Nope, What's, anything less than 100 is not correct, right? Uh, you want to make sure that you're testing it as much as possible, uh, as many test cases as possible, and they all gotta pass. Uh, we do do something like that in the, uh, the grader going forward. We'll test it with millions and millions of randomly generated inputs against a known correct solution. You don't have to write millions of test cases. <laughs> uh, I think that in your next hack, or not this hack, but the, the hack next week and your, your uh, like th this lab this week, you were only required to write one test case per function. Uh, and next week, we're gonna expect maybe two or three per function. Uh, so make sure that you get in the habit of writing test cases. And then next next week, or maybe that, maybe next week is next week, I don't know. Uh, yeah, next next week, you will be using a more formal unit testing framework called CMACA. Right? Uh, and uh, it, it does require some advanced knowledge that you, you won't need because we've, uh, we've done enough for you. You're gonna use ours as an example for writing your own r uh, test cases in a unit testing framework. A uh, unit testing framework just relieves you of the need of doing that boilerplate stuff of, oh, okay, it passed, increment a counter, it failed, increment a different counter, produce a summary at the end. The unit testing framework takes care of all that for you. All you have to do is write your tests and then it does all the rest of the work and pr produces an entire test suite, okay? All right, so rigorous testing for us means automated unit testing writing tests like we've been writing in your uh, lab so far. All right, I'll see you next week then.